Hey, Stefan, could not be more honored to have you as my first guest. Do you want to start by telling the listeners about your background and what sort of things you're up to these days? Professionally, I worked as a chartered accountant and mostly working inside internal audit in financial services uh, and consulting companies and things like that. I'm mostly known as a Bitcoin podcaster nowadays, so that's my main uh, thing. So I host a self-titled podcast about Bitcoin and Austrian economics. I wanted to just have a nicely curated track, a pathway of interviews with some of the leading people within the Bitcoin world. I came into this mostly from being interested in Austrian economics and the concept of free market money and challenging central banking. Let's talk about money. Let's go back to the basics. People say various things when they talk about money. I've heard money is a collective hallucination or money is debt or money is backed by faith in the government. What's going on here? In your view, what even is money? I think the best answer on this is by Karl Menger, the founder of the Austrian School. His essay called On the Origins of Money from the late 1800s is essentially spelling out money is the most marketable commodity. There's all these different goods out there in the world and they're competing to be money. The most saleable, the most liquid. How many other people also want this thing? It's somewhat of a network commodity. Fundamentally, what it's solving is, as economists would say, the double coincidence of wants problem. But I think the common confusion for most people is just that They haven't even thought about this question. So they will latch on to various ideas that might superficially seem right, but not as clarified or not as precise. There are some different conceptions of money. One of the well-known ones is this charterless idea. The king or the state is the ruler of the land, and that is why we use the government money or the king's money. And that's one understanding of how money arises and why it, it you know, exists a very top-down story, whereas the Menger story or the Austrian school is showing appreciation for the bottom-up emergent nature of money. There's a lot of different other points we can get into on that, but we have to fundamentally bring it back to what technology would we use if we didn't have money? Well, we would have to barter. And that is why we have to sort of understand money as the indirect medium of exchange. Let's say I make cows and you make bread and I want to give you a cow for your bread. The problem comes when people make things that aren't so easily divisible or easy to transfer, that there's not as much of a good market for. Nick Zabo wrote a really interesting essay on this called Shelling Out. I would highly recommend that. He builds on this idea that some of the earliest forms of money, proto money, were in fact things in relation to generational wealth transfer or for big transfers. Let's say a marriage and a dowry. It's a big payment. It's not just day to day. I'm giving you this for some bread or whatever. It was big payments. And that's how it started. And then over time, it evolved further. It is also another common confusion that people think of it like it's a collective hallucination or it's some kind of illusion that we all buy into. I think that's imprecise. Money is the best medium of exchange and it's the most marketable medium of exchange. I think that's the most precise way to conceive of it. Over time, through repeated interactions, some people figure out if I use this particular good as the medium of exchange, I will be able to facilitate more trades and I can more easily transport my value across time and space, as Menga said. That for me is the bedrock. That's the foundational way to think about this. And so it might be more appropriate to think of it as shared recognition. It's not arbitrary. It wasn't by chance that for thousands of years, humans used gold. There was some underlying reason behind that. There were different civilizations who had independently come to gold as their money. It's not arbitrary. It's not just like, oh, just by chance, we could have just used toilet paper as money or grass as money. Well, no, there's real characteristics that matter in terms of making some things better as a money. Yes, it's true that if you're in a prison or in a prisoner of war camp, maybe cigarettes are the money. But in the general case, there are certain objective characteristics that make some things better as a money than others. I, I love that. That's such a clear definition. Money is the most marketable commodity or money is the most saleable good. But if you look at the state of the world today, I, I don't know if I would call the, the $20 bill a commodity. What's the gap between most marketable commodity and here's a $20 bill? Murray Rothbard's What Has Government Done to Our Money or Guido Hulsman's The Ethics of Money Production are both phenomenal reads on this topic. Essentially, they highlight how 
fiat money, fiat means by decree, right? Fiat money never arose just voluntarily on the market. It always arose through coercion from the top down, from the government. Because gold is more liable to being centrally controlled, it tends to be stored in vaults or banks. And those banks represent choke points, control points. And the government can go and co-opt those. Governments sort of weaned people off of gold. And, and I'm not saying there was like some deep, dark guy pulling the strings in the background. It just happened to go in this way because if you're a politician, what do you want? You want more control over the money. You want to be able to debase it more easily so, so that you can essentially raid the accumulated wealth of the population. Over time, it goes from having gold, like directly using gold as transfers, then moving to a system where you might have paper tickets or claims that represent gold. And we just trade those claims around as though they were gold. And then governments doing things like confiscating gold or repricing the gold or later completely severing the connection with gold. The incentive is if you're a politician, you would rather use debt and you would rather take a lot of resources in a way that is not so obvious that you're taking them. And so this is where the you know, inflation tax, if you will, comes from. To summarize the answer, it's that over time, the world in some sense weaned itself off of gold and off of hard money because of the underlying technology not being good enough to resist that centralization. I think Bitcoin is a monetary technology that enables people to take back some of that power and essentially transfer power back to the individual and the family and the community instead of the government and the bureaucrats. Money can be a huge vector for control. And in the past, it would have not been feasible for a government to impose that level of control without also controlling the money system. At a high level, the other point to think about is when it comes to control over money, if there is some big centralized apparatus now it becomes about who wants to control that centralized apparatus. The view of commodity money is very straightforward. But today we have all these central banks, credit, all these different assets. What's going on there? There's a few directions we can go in there. Having many, many fiat monies like Australian dollars, US dollars, etc. It is in some quasi sense, it is a barter world. It's highly inefficient and it's, it's like an aberration because absent government intervention, we would see the world tend towards one best money. And then the next point I would say is, given that we have fiat money, we have a lot more debt. All we've known for our lives is a society with very cheaply available debt. It has created a, a funny incentive for people as well. If you're in your 20s or maybe even in your 30s, it makes sense, quote unquote, makes sense. It makes sense to go into big debt now because you want to buy your house now and over time, as inflation occurs, the amount you're paying back is way less. And there's also a leverage effect because everyone wants to lever up. That's what has driven a lot of this crazy housing run over the whatever last 30, 40, even 50 years. And that has created more of a financialization of society. It's not to say that financialization is bad. What I'm trying to point out here is more like the finance sector is larger than it would otherwise be if we were living under a hard money or a sound money, let's say gold or Bitcoin standard, I think the finance sector wouldn't be this dramatically large as it is today. I just think the overarching structure would be one where we would be living in a more equity-based society as opposed to a debt-based one. I also want to touch on the social aspect of how people say, oh, money, money is the root of all evil, or perhaps... <laughs> It somehow feels dirty to sell something as opposed to giving away your services for free. What's your opinion on how people relate to money today? Yeah, so I think fundamentally a lot of people are just socialists at heart, right? So <laughs> look, some of that is, I think a lot of them are taking what works in their family and applying that to the society. And that's not a good way to act. We should think of money just as a, it's a neutral coordination tool. It's just that it became vilified. If you want to be able to produce things at any serious level of scale, we need tools that can do that, that can achieve that. And money is this coordination tool that allows us to collaborate more effectively. Understand poverty is our default state. And if we didn't have 
these tools of coordination, the price mechanism, division of labor, and so on, if we couldn't do that, we'd be living in poverty. I think what causes some of that confusion is people don't understand the necessity of some of these, of coordination and prices, of balancing how much value different things are. To some, it can seem like, oh, profits are a dirty thing or a bad thing, but we should actually think of profits like they are a socially beneficial signal. And losses are a socially beneficial signal too, because it's telling you, hey, all things considered, if you're making a loss, you are using up valuable resources in society. You shouldn't do that. Stop doing that. But if you're making a profit and you're making a big profit, assuming you obviously haven't cheated anyone or frauded anyone or things like that, if you're making a big profit, then that is a signal that essentially the, the inputs that you are consuming are very cheap compared to the massive value that you are providing to society. We can grow this pie. It's a win-win game. We play this game and we can all win out of it. Whereas I think the people who tend to view money as the root of all evil, they tend to be thinking of it like, oh, you know, it's a fixed pie. Those big fat cats are taking too much of the pie. When I think of it more like, hey, just because Jeff Bezos can go and buy 20 yachts or whatever does not impinge on my ability to enjoy my life. Now, if they've done it in an immoral way, lying and cheating and stealing and whatever, then that's another whole story. But in and of itself, wealth and entrepreneurship and having a lot of money are not evil or bad things. And we have to sort of recognize that. And so really, it's more about having the society and the institutions that best enable the growth of the pie, if you will, so that, we, so that everyone can be prosperous. You mentioned kind of this socialist idea within the family and then money and profits as a coordination tool at scale. What changes at scale, like needing this sort of additional coordination tool when you go to a larger society? In the family, it makes sense because you can sort of manually calculate what you need to do and whether it's worthwhile. But at a society level, that information cannot be contained in any one person's head. We have to be humble. Money is the coordination tool that we use to then understand, is this worthwhile for society? Your profit and loss signal is how you know. It's kind of balancing out those considerations at a macro society level. Makes a lot of sense. So what I'm hearing is, if we ever get a super intelligent AI, we'll revisit the question. Even there, that's actually an interesting point because even there, that wouldn't necessarily know everyone's preferences. It's like this idea of demonstrated preference, right? I might tell you I like something, but if I'm not willing to give up a certain amount of money for that, then how much did I really prefer that? And so I think prices are a good way for that to be able to accurately determine what to produce in what quantity, in what time do you need it? How should it be made? All of these things need to be done through voluntary and private exchanges. Now I want to talk about the future. Would you mind painting me a picture of 20 years from now, 50 years from now, in your ideal society, how does money work and how do people relate to money? Well, okay, 20 years from now. Obviously, I'm a big Bitcoin fan. I think we will see more and more people escape the fiat world. In, in line with the sovereign individual thesis, I think we will see more people who slowly but surely just start storing some of their value in Bitcoin. They start transacting directly in Bitcoin and they will, in so doing, reduce some of the power of the state. I think it's also fair to say that as more people flow into Bitcoin, we will see more people set up areas that are less government influence, if you will, like a Liechtenstein or Monaco. I think we just see a lot more of those kinds of places coming up by the time we get to 2040. Eventually, they may start to go and build up actual you know, citadels or free private cities or charter cities and things like that. We might see more people who are willing to leave and go overseas and become a digital nomad because now they can just earn online. Now, there's a lot of different technologies that are required to make all these things feasible and possible and likely even. I just see Bitcoin as the most important one. Using that technology, I think we'll see more people effectively digitally secede. How do you think it affects day-to-day -day life on the ground, the way people relate to money? In terms of day-to-day -day life, people can set up ways to get paid in Bitcoin online. They might set up a BTC pay. We might see more people try to become independent contractors or 
entrepreneurs, even if they're just doing it as a side hustle over the next five to 10 years, I think people will slowly learn this idea of, hey, start being a saver, start accumulating capital. You need to protect your value. And this is how you do it. It's not possible for everyone, but where they're able to, they'll start saving in Bitcoin. To put it objectively, yeah, it's, it's speculative demand. But for many of us in this Bitcoin world, this is our savings. This is how we save for the long term. I think the, the description of Bitcoin as savings technology is an apt one. Right on. I know you've been studying these topics for a really long time and speaking with a lot of very thoughtful people. So I really do think our listeners should seriously think about your input when thinking about how to navigate their futures. Not financial advice, TM. But <laughs> of course. yeah, do you have any closing thoughts for our listeners before we wrap up? What kind of society do you want to live in? I just see a lot of people who perhaps are a bit too meek or too afraid or just too willing to just go with what the government and the mob are saying. I understand professionally or socially, it can be difficult, but try to make your thoughts known where you can because there are a lot of other people out there who feel similarly. Otherwise, yeah, just keep learning, keep going down that Bitcoin rabbit hole. I truly believe it's the most important technology that the world actually needs to develop and engage with because I think it's like a huge lever for so much other social progress and productivity. A really empowering note to end on. Where can the listeners find you? Well, stefanlevera.com is the place to find all my podcasts and stuff. And obviously you can find me on Twitter at Stefan Levera. All right. Thanks so much, Stefan.